just a loud talking person. Well, you always well, talk loud. I don't always talk loud. It's because usually you don't listen, so I have to talk louder so that you hear me. Otherwise, well, you're a teacher. All teachers talk loud. All teachers do talk loud. I think on that note, are we live and in person? It looks like we are live and in person or <laughs> on computer. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday, Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. The halfway mark. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Hope you enjoy the evening. Hope you've had a good day. I think. Oh, is today... and Noel, you're driving right now, so be careful. I think today. Is today St. Patrick's Day? It is. I didn't realize that until I got to work. I didn't either. So it's I funny. Didn't as, green. as you get a little bit older, St. Patrick's Day is just not. I guess it would really be the, the weekend, right? The weekend of St. Patrick's Day. Like if it's falling no. in the middle of the week, not it's not as big of a thing. I don't know if people are going to parades today, right? Well, I don't know what, what they're doing with these days. See, of well, that's a good point, too. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. where have so, you been? <laughs> I, I don't know. Where have you been since? Uh, <laughs> early 2020 <laughs> so there's nobody here at this parade i don't know why uh so hey, anyway thank you so much for being here glad you're here we have got a lot of cool things to talk about today and we are going to be you know i was thinking about filtration we get so many questions about filtration and i know we already kind of sort of did a live stream about filtration but that was really more about the different types in this video what i wanted to do in this live stream what i wanted to do is i thought it'd be cool to have a conversation about the types of filters that are available, but why we choose the filters that we choose. Like what is the thought process behind what we do? Because I think there may be some misconceptions about my favorite filter type. Cool. I'll let you go ahead in the, in the chat if you wanna try to guess what my favorite filter is. In just a little bit, I'm going to reveal that secret for the first time ever. Wow. On live TV. No, I know. No idea. It's, it's, it's going to be crazy. So a few announcements before we get started. I think that the number one announcement is we finally got the new merch. So huh? this, what is this shirt called? What did you call this I shirt? I call that, this is, right. the, this is the new watercolor. The new, I call it watercolor. The new watercolor shirt. Mm -hmm. And you've got a shirt. I've got, I've got my small scape shirt, Scape Gaze Repeat. Yep. The, so, an ode to the creative process. That is true, yeah. So in your, yeah. it's your first, the small scape like stuff, yeah, merch or whatever, on and then your website on my website, yeah. So, so everything is little... at yeah primetimeaquatics.com. Yeah, uh, and then you're also I'm sporting some merch, uh, some uh, flare. I've got seven pieces of flare right here because yep. we decided to start rolling out. We're gonna be having new merch come out like every so often now. It's been a long time since we've come out with anything new, so we've got stuff rolling out. This is the first step, and we, we started to do, we, we wanted to do old school. Kick cool. it off with the old school nods with the pins for flare yep. and the uh, the magnets. Oh, they stick together. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Now you have to hold it back because okay. we're not on autofocus. So. See, it's the nice square magnet Yeah. in all the different, see, they're all like And so the refrigerator technically could have seven pieces of flare too. Yeah. Now I wonder, you just dropped all those on the ground, I did. huh? I did, but you know what? Here, wait, I wanted to hold on. on. Here, hold on here. And also, if you haven't looked on the website yet, we did include, I wanted a happy Monday button and stuff, so I figured I'd just order some more and include it, because, you know, happy Monday. <laughs> I love it. I was just going to ask. I was just going to ask, does anybody know what the pieces of flair, what movie that's from? And Amanda's already saying it. She's like, Oh, well, seven Thanks. pieces of flair, Office Space. Yeah, yep. you got it. But what's funny is the girl in Office Space, her name was Joanne. And Joanne, Joanne. wasn't wearing... No, it, her name was not Joanne. Wasn't it? It was Joanna. It was my exact well, it name. Was. Jennifer okay. Aniston played Joanna. Which... That's right. And she wasn't wearing the requisite number of pieces of flair that you're no. supposed to wear. No. So anyway, yeah. So check out the website if, if you like magnets and, and buttons and And you'll, I just shirts. wanted to... Our fish approved. You'll see this, and it's been on our chalkboard design. Unless, unless you haven't seen the chalkboard design, just so you know, ever since the start, it's it's always yeah. been on there. It's so, been on yeah, there. Yeah. There yeah. we go. So, uh, yeah. So that's the story there. Uh, the other thing is, <laughs> you actually got your 
So Joanna got her video done early this week, and she never does that. Never Usually, do. I am like rushing to get this thing done on Thursday evening, and you got it to me a day early. And so what I did was I just said, you know, set it to release the next day like I always do, not realizing I was actually finishing the video a day early. So <laughs> if you were looking for a video yesterday or this morning at 9 a.m., it came out yesterday. Yeah. And you did a really cool thing. You found a really cool what I would. I, it's a it's a plant. I had aquatic plant I'd never seen before. So. On the small scape, oh, that's, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And then this Friday, so a, a number of people said they like the science series that we've just started to do. And it's going to kind of be a more in-depth discussion based on what we're talking about tonight. And so we've got a cool science series video coming out on Friday. And it's, I think it's going to be, it, it, it's going to solve or answer some questions that people have, some common misconceptions, I think. And then we're going to be talking about filtration next. If you have more you, more questions, you want more answers, there are videos in the description below where we talk about how to choose the right filter. We talk about how to uh, clean sponge filters, and there's all we've done so many different comparisons on how to compare one filter type and another filter type. And there's like a million videos in our catalog. And, certain, and some of them in the description about filtration. If you if you really love filtration, I promise you there's more. Bonnie, thank you so much for the super chat. I really like box filters. These are easy to maintain, and you can put various media in there. They don't explode debris out like mm. the sponge filters can. That's yeah. absolutely true. That's true. And I remember when when I first started keeping fish back in the 1970s, that was what we used. We had the, I think I remember them being green for some reason. And it always seemed like there was a spot in there for charcoal, and then you'd put the filter floss on that, and that was how, that was how we ran wow. our tanks for a very long time until I think the hang on back filter was the next thing. And back in those days, so you had the box filter, and then the heaters were not fully submersible. You had to actually attach them to the the rim of the tank, and if they fell in, that could be very dangerous. And we had the aluminum top for the lights, which got hot. And because, <laughs> of well, because they were the incandescent lights too. They were like light bulbs. <clears throat> so that, those got very, very warm. Oh, it's okay. You can just cough right over my thing. <coughs> I'm sorry. You all right there? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Clint wanted to know how many pieces of flare are required. I thought it was, well, I, I thought the guy was wearing 27 pieces of flare. I thought it was 15. No, I, well, 15 might have, no, I, 15 might have been required, but the dude I think was wearing 27. Okay. Now, as some of you know, we've got, we run generally speaking between 70 and 80 fish tanks. And so I wanted to give you a little background as to the filtration that we have currently in our fish room and talk a little bit about the decision making process and why my favorite filter might surprise you. So, with 70 to 80 tanks, could you imagine, just stop for a second and use your imagination brain if I had like, each tank was running a hang on back filter. I am fairly certain hmm. that the electric bill would be prohibitive, prohibitively, Prohib prohibitive. prohibitively expensive. Oh. Uh, so that is out of the question. And so we had to come up with a way to filter our tanks that was not going to make us very, very poor. And that is <laughs> one of the reasons why we chose the sponge filter because the nice thing about sponge filters, and as you get a lot of tanks, one of the decision making processes is how many tanks do you have? And where are they located? Now, luckily for us, most of the 70 to 80 tanks that we have are located in our basement in the fish room. So it was relatively easy to build out an air system using one central pump that powered the entire fish room. And all we had to do is put the sponge filters in the tanks and we were ready to go. Hmm. And so that's one thing to think about. How many tanks do you have? That's gonna help you determine, okay, how much power am I really willing to use to filter these tanks? Tesla, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. <laughs> okay, next thing is the maintenance side of things with what we do. And then just maintenance, filter maintenance in general. For me, I generally want something easy to maintain. And the sponge filters are easy to maintain as you're going to see something that we kind of cover a little bit on Friday. We can just take them out, rinse them out, put them right back in. To do that for a sponge filter, even on a weekly basis, takes, I don't know, a minute. All right, so that's relatively easy to, to deal with. It's saving energy. Now, the downside of what we do is sponge filters are, are really great at biological filtration. So in other words, they house a lot of bacteria. They have a lot of surface area, 
a lot of beneficial bacteria. And so I'm never worried about biological filtration in any one of our tanks. I've said it so many times, we overfilter our tanks regarding biological filtration and that's fine. The problem with the sponge filters is the mechanical side, the ability to suck the, the particulate matter out of the water column. And so that's, that's a downside for us. Now, interestingly enough, even though we have sponge filters in all of our tanks, we also still run, I think, somewhere between seven and 10 hang on back filters. Hmm. Some of them, it just works out better, but most, almost all the time, we're using the hang on back filters for mechanical filtration and some of our more heavily stocked tanks, like our cichlid tanks, Mbuna tanks, peacock tank, uh, our 125s, all have a hang on back filter for mechanical filtration. Those things, really easy to maintain. Just take out the filter media, the filter floss, and you're done in a couple of minutes. We still, or we do, have a couple of internal canister filters running. And for the most part, the reason we are running those is we've got tanks where we want the extra mechanical filtration, but maybe a hang on back or an additional hang on back wouldn't really look that great on the outside of the tank. So I'm thinking the 50 gallon low boy, the multi tank. I really don't want to look at a hang on back filter on that tank. It kind of ruins the vibe but yet I needed a little bit more mechanical filtration. And so that's what we use there. We don't currently have any sumps running in our fish room. We don't have any external canister filters running either. Finn Wiggles, thank you so much for the number one fan oh, sticker. Thank really you. appreciate it. And then James, thank you so mm. much for the super chat. Uh, over the top sump, love it, totally customizable, does wonders for my 55 gallon sick fish needs diagnosing if there is time later sure we can certainly look at that later on just leave that in the, the chat a little bit later so when it came to our decision process then we use the sponge filters out of necessity for me personally i think there is kind of a cutoff that i have where i switch from my favorite filter which here we go are you ready mm. my favorite filter is not a sponge filter I know, it's shocking. We run them all the time. They're really easy. They have a ton of advantages. But my favorite filter is hang on back. And so I really like the hang on back filters for a number of reasons. One, they're, again, they're easy to maintain. I can maintain a hang on back filter in about 15 seconds. I just pull the floss out, put new floss in, done. That is all it takes. The hang on back filters that have the internal uh, impellers hmm. and motors, they're really quiet. They're self-priming. And so I really like the convenience of the hang on back filter. Now, th with that being said, it just it wasn't economical to have those in our tanks. And so for me, once I got past that like 10 or 12 fish tanks, I started looking at the sponge filter. It just became a necessity because at that point it's like, am I really gonna run 15, 20, hang on the back filters? It just didn't make sense from an energy perspective. And quite frankly, we would have had to add new circuits to the basement. So the hang on back filter tends to be my favorite because it's easy, not the sponge filter. For us, if I were switching from hang on back filter to a canister filter, my decision making process really has to do with the stocking level, the way I want the tank to look and the size of the tank. And so for me, if I were running like a show tank, like let's say we had one in our living room, we broke our rule <laughs> and we actually brought a tank upstairs. If that tank was probably 180 or larger, that's when I personally would begin to think about a canister filter. Now, it makes perfectly good sense for most people if they've got a, a showcase tank and maybe you don't want to see the hang on back filters on the back of the tank. Maybe they make a little bit too much noise. Maybe what you're concerned about is water flow and dead spots, especially in a larger tank. And so the advantage to the canister filter or a sump even is that you can put the return and the intake on opposite sides of the tank. And so you get better water flow. You get better circulation. You have a higher likelihood of picking up some of that detritus and that those waterborne particulate matter little pieces all over your tank where the hang on back filter might not be as good with that particular aspect. The problem for me is oh, maintenance. I had canister filters in the fish room. I really, really dreaded the maintenance side of things. We even had for a very long time, I don't know if you remember, on that 20 gallon, 
Remember we had the little, they actually had, we actually had a hang on back canister filter. Remember that on that planted 20 gallon with the fake background? The we fake did? rock? Yeah. And I hated that thing. <laughs> Where I, I absolutely despise it. And the only reason why it was on there is I built the, the fake rock background and there was no way I could put a hang on back filter after I finished it because like, there was no place to put the intake. So I'm like, <laughs> well, this looks nice. What am I going to do? So I was basically Bummer. like, I'm going to have to find something that's going to be able to allow me to put the, the um, intake mm -hmm. anywhere I want. And so we had this little canister hang on back filter. And it was horrible. And <laughs> I dreaded cleaning that thing because you've got to make sure it's sealed tightly. And then if it mm. wasn't, it was sucking in air. And it wasn't the best made thing. But even the larger ones, it's like, there's this, you know, you got like a little leak or something like that. Or it's blowing out the bubbles. Or you got to prime the thing. And taking it apart is, at least for me, kind of a pain. Now, granted, you might not have to do it as often as a hang on back. But I would rather, weekly, go through the hang on back. Just whip out the floss and put new floss in. And take 30 seconds to do that. Then the 15, 20, 25 minutes it's going to take me to bust out my canister filter once a month or so yeah. and change that out. But again, the decision-making process, and, and some of that is really up to you. But for us, the reason why we don't have canister filters is the hang-on backs that we have do a really good job. They do a good job of taking out the particulate matter from the more heavily stocked tanks. And if I didn't have as many, maybe I've got a six-foot tank, maybe it's like the 125s that we have, I would probably just run two hang-on backs because... I know I'm lazy. I know I don't want to clean the canister filter. And I'm perfectly okay with the hang on back and the way it looks at least pretty much anywhere. The sumps for us, I think the decision making process would have to be, well, one, you've got at this point maybe a drilled tank. You've got a relatively heavy bio load and you want something that's really quiet and you want something that's customizable, there are a lot of cool things about the sump, right? You can you can actually put a light under your tank and grow plants and have that be extra filtration. Maybe that helps reduce nitrates. Maybe you've got an entire tank full of cichlids. And you're like, man, you know what? These African or even South and Central American cichlids, they're digging. There's no way I can keep plants. I really don't want to look at pothos growing all over the place. It's supposed to be kind of a centerpiece tank in a living room or a family room. Well, if you've got a larger tank and you put a sump under there, then you could put a light in your stand and grow pothos there, or grow aquatic plants because there's not going to be fish in there. Some people will use that area to put fish just in kind of quarantine, not necessarily quarantine new fish, but maybe a fish has gotten a little beat up. They'll put them down in one part of the sump just to kind of give them a break. Again, you can customize it. You can put all kinds of different biomedia in there. Again, for me, that would only makes sense if I had a larger tank. So at least six feet. Do people put sumps in smaller tanks? Absolutely. Can they be useful? Sure. And so the point is when it comes to picking and choosing your filtration, one is you got to determine how many, the number of tanks that you have, right? That's going to be important. If it's us and I've got less than 10 or 12, I'm going to hang on back. When I get over that, I go sponge filters just because we have so many tanks and they're not showcase tanks that are just like in my living room. For canister filters, for me personally, I like to use them. I would prefer to use them in a larger tank that's got a pretty heavy stocking. Uh, it's heavily stocked, most likely a six foot tank. That's what I'm starting to think about the canister filters. So probably like a 180 for me or above, but does it work on any six foot tank yet? Do they work on smaller tanks? Absolutely. You just have to be willing to maintain them. And for the sumps, I probably, me personally, I don't know if I would mess around with the drill tanks and the sumps until I was in a much larger situation hmm. yeah that's me okay. that's my opinion on the matter um there's a couple other filters that we've used we have you know you mentioned the box filters uh we've used those before i used them when i was a kid i like them but when it compares to the sponge filter i just like the ease of cleaning the sponge filter a little bit more box filters are kind of easy too you can just open them up take out the floss put new floss in and be done yeah yeah but that's kind of cool. Yeah. But the sponge filter, you just take that out, squeeze it out, and you're done there as well. The other thing to consider is sometimes people use matten filters. Now, matten filters, in my opinion, can be cool, especially if you've got stuff like shrimp. But the problem that we have with some of the matten filters is we've used them in some of our tanks, but for with fish, the minute you take that thing out, and if you've got substrate in the tank, it's a lot more cumbersome to take a matten filter out of a tank than it is a sponge filter. And so 
when I'm looking at the two, I prefer the sponge filters just because they're a little bit easier to maintain than a matte filter, even though I think the matte filter can look nice, especially if you have maybe it all, all the way to over one corner and maybe you just paint the front of the tank where the matte filter would normally be so you don't even know it's there. That is almost like a hidden wall. It's like a wall of filtration and yeah. looking at the tank head on, you wouldn't even really know it's there. So that's kind of cool. So yeah, the matte filters. The other thing too to consider is the sponges you've got different pore sizes. And I know a lot of people say, you know what, I have problems with my sponge filters because you know, I, I, I take them out and they release all the stuff all over the tank. So I'm trying to figure out how do I keep the sponge filters from making my tank look horrible. That, at least for us, that problem only happens with coarse sponge filters, right? The, the sponge filters have the bigger holes. We use fine, pour sponge filters in pretty much all of our tanks and we don't have that problem almost at all part of it is because we maintain them every week but very rarely do we like pick up a sponge filter and like there's stuff going out in the tank and that's because those pore sizes are so small they trap the detritus and stuff in there where with the larger pore sizes that does become a problem where you pick it up it's like wow you know what yeah this thing trapped a bunch of stuff but now it's right back in my tank again or what can be kind of problematic is if you've got sand and you've especially got fish that like to spit the sand everywhere, like cichlids, and now they're spitting the sand in the coarse sponge filter. And we've had that where it's like, okay, now we've got the sponge filter, and we put it in the sink after most of the detritus is dumped back into the tank. And yes, there are ways to get around that. You can put it in a bag and do all this stuff to get it out and minimize that. But then it's like, well, now I've got sand in my sink, all right? So again, there are ways to get around those issues, but with the fine pores, it's just not an issue. We, we don't experience that at all. So that's kind of the story there. That's kind of the, the direction that we go, why we choose the filters that we choose. Yes, I finally basically publicly stated it's the hang on back filter. That's my favorite. I just like its convenience and what it does. Hmm. So yeah, that's the story. I say we keep the monologue short tonight and answer some questions and, and talk about some things that people want to talk about. You got anything? Cool. Have you been looking or are you just... I have. Okay. What well, we yeah. Have? I know, um, um, let's see, uh, Finn Wiggles, she said that she swapped out for uh, Hang On Backs and is really happy about it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I would be too. I really wish I could. Although, Clint, thanks so much for the shout out. He said that I'm really good at hiding your sponge filters. Not really. <laughs> Only half the time because I always set out, I'm going to hide the sponge filter and then I forget. I do the scape and then I'm like... Ugh. It just has to go where it goes. But yeah, the hang on back, they're so convenient. You just pop open the tap, check yep. out the old stuff, put in some new stuff. Well, and you just mentioned, well, Clint just mentioned something that I didn't really even mention because I, I guess I don't mention it because I don't even care for the most part. And that's the looks. And it's funny because in my brain, I didn't even like think about that as like a potential downside Such to our fisher. Nerd. And it is, <laughs> it's a horrible thing to look at. I mean, <laughs> yeah. sponge filters are ugly. They are. They are. They're, it's okay. It's okay to say they're ugly. It doesn't mean your tank is ugly. Uh, I don't necessarily think any of my tanks are ugly. I like looking at all of them. But compared to if you just had to look at a little intake mm -hmm. and, and then maybe in a caster filter, a little tiny return. So two little tubes. And most of the time, they're black tubes. And if you've got a black background, you barely even see them. It's like, hmm, I don't even realize the filter's in there. And even better, with like the sump, you get the same situation, but then your heater, if you have to run a heater, goes in the sump. Yeah. And so you don't even see any of that stuff. That's pretty cool. I'd kill for that in my 12 gallon. Well, you know what's interesting too is we're starting to see that pop up with like a lot of the smaller kit tanks where they've got space inside of that kind of the the filtration system that comes with it. Yeah. Right, they got a little filtration wall. Yep. And then they've got a space in there where you can put like a little nano heater. I think that's a good idea. So it's very it's very seamless looking. I've got two tanks coming up that I bought uh, like a few weeks ago that I'll probably be saving yeah, on I forgot my you got those because they're small. Yeah. <laughs> they're so cute. So uh, that's 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 definitely an advantage. Yeah, the sponge filters don't look the best. That's that's definitely a good point. Uh, James asks, Jason, do you have any do you have an outflow preference on the canister filters. I hear there's a bunch and uh, serve different functions. So with the canister filters that we've run, I, I so I generally don't use the spray bars. A lot of canister filters come with the spray bars and they can shoot out. And the only reason I don't use them is just because of the noise. 
I don't usually with the spray bars you kind of elevate that a little bit above the the surface and so I generally just use the standard return and I it depends on the tank but I really prefer to have my obviously my intake and my return on opposite sides of the tank and so like for instance on the 50 gallon low boy molly tank the planted tank the they were on the technically the same side but the return was flowing out the four foot way and it kind of created this gentle gentle whirlpool where the intake was over here on the on the 24 inch side but on the same side and so it just kind of did this and so i prefer to have that that flow closer to the surface because really if you think about it a canister filter is not really giving you any oxygen concentration right there's nothing the water is never going external right and one of the things when it comes to filtration and especially water oxygenation is you want to have oxygen exchange and gas exchange at the surface and it's even better like with the hang on backs or like some people will use you know especially if they've got like an aquaponic system where the water is kind of flowing and it's bouncing down rocks and stuff well as that's happening it's it's really doing a great job of gas exchange before it gets back into the tank and so I prefer if I'm running a canister filter or if I were running a sump I would want to have that return that's kind of closer to the surface and getting more of that gas exchange at the surface and I also think by doing that if you've got fish that want to maybe have a break they're not getting blown around the tank mid-level the downside to that is maybe you're not getting as much circulation at the bottom and so if there's any detritus down there it might not be getting into the intake quite as easily but that's just it's a personal preference I don't know if there's necessarily anything that's any one thing that's absolutely right or absolutely wrong unless I guess the return was flowing outside of your tank onto the floor that could be bad yeah, it right. would be bad yes yes yeah that's my deep thought for the day wow. um, I saw hold on a second here my chats now all locked up and froze froze up on me you see this thank Look. you Finn Wiggles for the super chat just wanted wanted to hear you say Finn Wiggles <laughs> 12 gallon long just got delivered today <gasps> what Rock you have to say Finn Wiggles though rock on Finn Wiggles yeah that's awesome <laughs> 12 gallon long it's like the greatest tank they don't really make anymore so I'm glad you found one because that's really cool and if they for those of you who don't know the 12 gallon longs are only 12 gallons right so it's only two gallons more than a 10 gallon how about that for math wow but these bad boys are three feet long and I think what were they like maybe maybe it's like I don't even know if it's 10 inches tall by 10 wow. inches wide but it's just a great tank you can put a wide variety of fish having that three foot of length and uh, driftwood Danya, thank you so much for the sticker. Aww, the Danya. loving cat. Aww, it might be a coyote. The loving coyote. I'm not sure, but he's so cute. The loving animal. <laughs> uh, Michael, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, what would you, uh, what would you, fil what kind of filtration? All right, so hold on. Filtration would you recommend for a 75 gallon that I plan on stocking with Geophagus Tapos or Electric Blue Acara with dithers? So if I if that was if I was just setting up a 75, I would have two hang on back filters, two smaller ones. And I do that for a couple of reasons. One, anytime I have a tank that's over three feet long, and even some of the 40 gallon breeders that we have, I like to have filtration on both sides, but they're smaller filters. So a for instance, a Marine Land Pro 4, 450 would absolutely handle the biological filtration as 75, just one of them. But for me, I would prefer and you pick, you pick your favorite hang on back filter. It doesn't really matter. I, again, I tend to like filters that have the internal impeller and motor because they're quiet and they're self priming. But maybe what I would do, 75 gallons. So typically you want to filter that thing, have flow through of about five, so five gallons per hour times the number of gallons you have. So what would that be? That would be 150, 300, 375. You see how I did that math all my brain? Amazing. Yeah. So you'd want to have it maybe, let's just say 400 gallons per hour going through that tank minimally. So your, your Marineland Pro 450, as an example, would be able to do that. But maybe what I would do is have two smaller ones. Just make sure, if they're a little bit smaller, that those filters are going to fit over the rim of your tank, especially the 75s. And check that first. Like before I even unbox the thing, I would just be like, okay, I'm going to pull this out of the box. I'm going to set it on the back of the tank. Okay, it fits great. If it doesn't, 
back in the box, then you gotta go back to the store, unfortunately. But I'd have two smaller hang on the backs on either side, and then at least hit that four to 500 gallons per hour. And the Geofagus Topos and Electric Blue Car are both gonna, they're, I wouldn't do necessarily both. I know you said or, which is good. And yeah, and then just pick one. They're both awesome fish. I mean, you can't go wrong with either one. The Electric Blue Car are gonna be a little bit easier in terms of aggression. They just generally aren't that aggressive, which should be helpful and not as stressful. And it's not like the Geophagus Topos will be, but if they start to breed, they get a little bit more, little bit more aggressive. All right, you ready? Here's a fun question. Okay, this is from Green. What method or aspect of biological filtration would you guys say is underrated? What, say it again? What method or aspect of biological filtration would you say is underrated? I don't know if I would, I, I think what's, un, what's unappreciated maybe is how much biological filtration happens in a fish tank without the need of an actual filter. When we really think about the biological mm -hmm. side, mm -hmm. what the main purpose, it's got two things that it's doing. One, it's housing media that is surface area for, by, for the microbes, nitrosomonas, nitrobacter, and the other nitros to actually do the nitrification process. But I think the more important thing is the flow, is keeping the water moving. And so I think one of the things that might be underappreciated is just how many, how much biological filtration is going on inside the tank itself. Your tank is essentially also a filter, provided that it has the water flow and the oxygen concentrations so that the nitrobacter and nitrosomonas and all the other nitro bacteria can do their job. That's why I always say for us, even, I mean, we've had 20 gallon longs breeding tanks where we had a hundred super red bristle nose that were juveniles and we had one ATI hydro two sponge filter, which is like this big around and it was running just fine and never, not once had an issue with ammonia or nitrite. And of course, nitrates would get high, but filtration, standard filtration doesn't deal with nitrates. So I think that's probably one of the things, and it's the reason why a lot of people can get by with not really using a traditional filter as long as they've got air stones or maybe a wave maker just to keep the oxygen concentrations up. Now, realistically, for a lot of us who keep fish, it's not easy to do the filterless tanks. And so we get asked this all the time because I did a, a fish room tour with L.R. Bretz one time, and his, he's got, a, I think, almost all of his tanks, if not every single one, is it's not running filtration. In fact, most of them aren't even running sponge filters, and some of them aren't even running air. But he's got a bunch of plants, and they're appropriately stocked for what he's doing. If I were to try that non-filtered stuff in one of my cichlid tanks, that isn't going to work. And the reason it's not going to work isn't even because of the biological side, it's because there would be so much detritus going all over the place, the water would look horrible, and it just wouldn't be a good tank to look at. So, yeah, I think that's that's my spiel. Uh, JRS Aquatics, thank you so much for the super chat. Would love to put together my own matten filters for all of my tanks, but they're usually pretty expensive. Know of anywhere to purchase the foam in bulk rolls of 12 and a half by 18 and a half widths. Yes, I would say your best bet is probably gemco.com. We're not sponsored by them or anything. Uh, you'll have to call them, so they don't do online orders. At least they don't as of the last time I ordered from them, but they generally do a lot of uh, bulk ordering. And so like we get these massive, huge things of filter floss. Usually we get them from Gemco. And that's so, J-E-H-M-C-O, correct? Yes, J-E-H-M-C-O.com. Uh, that would be a great place to look. That's where I would start. They've basically got every kind of thing you could possibly imagine. All right, let's see here. D DMND Dog 2 Would you recommend any Synodonis cats for beginners? Uh, specifically the Synodonis uh, Eupterus, thanks, um, for beginners. They're not difficult fish to keep. I, I think as long as, as you, if you've got any experience with cichlids at all, African cichlids, they, they generally require the same water parameters. They are somewhat active, but they can also be a little bit reclusive, and so they'll hide sometimes. But there's, there's nothing necessarily, like, 
especially challenging about them. So um, they, if you are someone who's got maybe a 75 gallon or less, look at the dwarf petrocolas. I think those could be, we've got those things all over the fish room. So um, those would be a good option. But yeah, I, I, I like them. I think they're great fish, a little bit active, but definitely cool. I just want to say thank you so much to all of our moderators, Riddle, Clint, I don't know, is Mary Page here? Probably stopping by. But thank you so much for for holding down the fort and everything you do. Um, Liz, thank you so much for the super chat. Love your channel. Thanks for the great advice. Can you have too much filtration? That's a great question. Can you have too much filtration in a tank? It's a, for, we did a video on it um, a while back. And the point I made in the video is it's not that you're going to have too much filtration. It's not like some horrible bad thing is necessarily going to happen because the microbes in the tank and as part of the filtration are only going to grow to the bio load that's available. So those microbes have to eat. And what those microbes are eating, some of them are, are basically, and it sounds weird to say, but they're eating the ammonia. They're eating the, the waste from the fish. So that's going to be their limiting factor usually, provided that you've got water flow and there's enough oxygen there, which that usually isn't a problem. But So they're only going to grow to the amount of ammonia that's available. And then they're going to produce nitrite when they eat the ammonia. And so then you've got a different group of bacteria that are going to eat the nitrite. And that's it's, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So however much, it, let's just say to keep, I don't know, you have 100 units of ammonia. That 100 units of ammonia is going to get converted to 100 units of nitrite, which will then get converted to 100 units of nitrate. And so that's your limiting factor. And so that's what you're looking at. So if you if you add a bunch of filters, so if you've got like, oh, I've got two sponge filters, but I'm just not sure. So I added a hang on back and then I added a canister. If you don't have a, a large bio load, that extra capacity isn't going to matter on the biological side. Where things get more interesting is on the mechanical side, the ability to, for a filter to pull stuff out of the water column. And so that's when, like I said, with a four foot tank, I generally like to have two filters, whether it's a sponge filter on each side or two hang on back filters. And that's got more to do with water flow and mechanical filtration, pulling stuff out of the water column. And so that's, that's kind of how I look at it. Usually if you're adding extra filtration because maybe we're scared that there's going to be an ammonia spike or a nitrite spike, that's... You can do that, but you're wasting money. And the other thing to consider is if you've got too much flow in your tank. And so like in a 75 gallon, maybe we're like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to run that Marine Land Pro 450 on one side of the tank. And on the other, I'm going to run another one, full blast. And I'm going to put angelfish in there. Well, if you do that, that's going to create a lot of flow and that could stress out fish. So really when it comes to overfiltration, it's about how much money do you want to spend? Are you wasting money? and making sure that the flow is appropriate for your fish. That's a great question. Glad you asked it. Thank you again for the super chat. All right, what do we got? And Finn Wiggles, you're right. We do have the best moderators ever. Oh yeah, That's, that, that goes without saying. Obviously. Yep. And you know, Clint said that he was wearing his, um, his uh, chalkboard shirt. Too. I love it, I love it. Right on. Yep, and again, I hope to see some of you if you're down in the Southeast in June, we're gonna be hopefully at the aquatic, I mean, 99% sure we're going to be at the aquatic experience. Aquatic experience. No, I didn't say that. Oh. Uh, Aquashella. Awkward. Yeah, whoops. Uh, that's not even a thing anymore, the aquatic experience. No, that's that really was, sad, too. That was in New Jersey. That was fun every fall. It wasn't fun. It was, well, it was well, It was more fun when it was here because then we could get all the cool stuff and bring true. it back. Uh, <laughs> let's see right. here. Like free gravel and. Yep. Wait, wait uh, here, James Manning left his, his feeding question. Oh, okay. Okay. Every once in a while, I feed my SRD flower horn beef heart, mm -hmm. deveined and defatted. Mm -hmm. Last two times, he turned an awful, awful color. Ooh. Ooh. Should I be worried? Could beef heart make him sick? Maybe. Just stop feeding it for a while and see if it gets better. Um, if you want to switch to blood worms or maybe you've got some high quality pellets, yeah, it could just be. Just could be sitting in his stomach the wrong way, a little bit too much protein. Maybe he's overeating a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, fish do that sometimes, especially flower horns can be very aggressive eaters. So that's something to consider. You know, just switch it up. And again, the 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 pellets you know, and flower horns sometimes aren't picky. You might be able to give them like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna give him some kelp pellets for a while and see how he <laughs> likes that. Um, yeah, just maybe switch it up a little bit. 
Hmm. Uh, Eve says, hello, fish peeps. Love catching a live chat. Just bought a new filter to set up today. Title 35, looking forward to seeing how quiet it might be. Appreciate talking filtration. Uh, Title 35 is a great filter. Um, the only the only downside is if you've got a really tall tank, the intake isn't incredibly long. Uh, the, the one thing about both the Seachems and the Marineland Pro series, because I'll hear people say, man, you know what? This wasn't as quiet as you said, I'm hearing the water. And that's never been a problem for us, but what we generally do is we make sure our water line in the tank is filled. You know how you've got like the rim on a tank? I don't know what it is with me, but I don't like to see the water go below that, like the rim, like the plastic, hmm. you know, rim yeah, thing. Yeah, doesn't. So we make sure that we fill the water above that and it stays that way all week. And because of that, the the little lip that comes down off of those hang on back filters is actually technically under the water. So it just, we don't hear, it. I don't hear any flow from that. But when the water level drops, that's when you might hear a little bit of splashing. I saw a question and I don't remember who asked it, but we were talking about oxygen levels and especially with canister filters and how they don't have a lot of oxygen because the whole thing's enclosed. And somebody asked the question, well, would the spray bars help with that? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. That's one. That's the reason. One of the reasons why they have them is because then the water can kind of exit the thing and the the um, the return and kind of catch a little bit of air before it goes in. It catches some air. It caught some red air and then it kind of goes in. So yeah, that would definitely help with that situation. Uh, Clint says, "I can't wait for Aquashella. Got my tickets. Wow, that's awesome. Woo-hoo. So that's very cool. So the Florida one is, like I said, the Florida one's in June. Yeah. Chicago technically right now is of right now is in August. And then the Dallas one right. is so, Halloween weekend. So Clint, which one are you talking about? Are you talking about Florida? Well, yeah, I don't think they're Dallas? selling tickets for Dallas yet. No. I don't think they would be. I don't know. Maybe they are. You're Texas, aren't you, Clint? Hey, that's a that's not a far drive. But you should Let's go to see. Florida anyways. Well, go to both. Go to both. Go to all three. Uh Delta Charlie, thank you so much for the super chat. Thanks, guys. I now plan my weekly tank maintenance to coincide with your stream. <laughs> did you know Mike Judge was the f- the flare? I did not know that was the flare waiter actor in Office Space. He the was? one who was wearing all the flare, the goofy one, like the that blonde was like guy, obnoxious. The, this guy, <laughs> which like some shrimp poppers and some uh, pizza poppers pizza. and some and some jalapeno. I don't remember what it was now, but shrimp poppers. I think they were shrimp. I don't remember, but I that's Mike Judge? Wow, really? that's crazy. That I did not know. That's great trivia. I love trivia like that. Uh, let's so see here. Fun. Carolyn says, Prime Time Aquatics, I talked too much, so I couldn't thank you in my question above. <laughs> <laughs> well. Hi, Carolyn. You, you, you're welcome. Wait, uh, but wait. Uh, did hold you get that? Dude, shh, shh. I see the question. Do you? I see the question. Can you yeah. read it that far? All right. It says, I got a new 14-gallon cube today, so we'll plant yeah. and cycle it. I want to get dwarf grami. Would do, uh, what do I need to know if I want to add more than one or is it a bad idea? Depends on how much stress you want. If you are the type of person who's like, you know what? I could use a little more stress in my life. I could use a little bit of (laughs) angst. Add more than one. No, Uh, the dwarf garamis, the females are less aggressive than the males and they don't really look that much different. But I probably in a 14 gallon would just add the one because even with a couple females, you just never know with them. They get a couple screws loose. The next thing you know, they're chasing each other around. One's in a corner. You're like, now what am I supposed to do with this other one? (laughs) So and with a 14 gallon, it'll be a really pretty centerpiece fish. It really will be. And you'll you'll Mm -hmm. enjoy it. If you get one, it's guaranteed to most likely, it's guaranteed to probably be okay. (laughs) Wow. You like that? That was amazing. Like my Mm non-committal answer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, more than one, it's... It's a probably not going to be the best situation. All right, let's see. Wait, all right. So Kylan wants to know which felt which filter is better for a Columbia wolf fish, and is a wolf fish a cichlid? I've never heard of a wolf fish. Are we just Colombian? Are we just talking about the dovi? Because that's the only wolf. Or are we talking about that goby looking thing? Hold on, because if we're talking about the goby looking thing. And not the dovi. I'm, I'm going into the, the whole, uh, yeah, that's the the goby looking guy. So that's an interesting thing. Um, one of my, I think this is the fish. Wait, this thing is huge. The one I'm pulling up is like there's people holding this thing and it's like six feet long. So, Ew. but 
my buddy Tim, I did a, a fish room tour, and then maybe there's different species that get smaller, I hope. Otherwise, <laughs> I hope you've got like a 10,000 gallon tank. Um, so let me know if it's the dovi cichlid or like the goby looking thing. That will be helpful. Okay, let's see here. Uh, moving on down. Um. All right, from Josh, what is a good dither fish to put with my askers to lessen aggression? Depends on the size tank. Um, I, I mentioned this from time to time. I like silver dollars, especially if it's like a, you know, a 125-ish. By the time you get to the 180s, now you're probably looking at maybe ballast sharks, which can be pretty cool. You need something bigger um, that the Oscar can't eat full grown, so ballast sharks. If you've got something like a 220, or larger. Now you're looking at things like tinfoil barbs can be pretty decent. That could be all. That could be okay, for sure. Um, HVAC Smith wolf fish is a downright nasty fish. Yeah, I don't. But I'm not. It doesn't look cute. Well, at if, all. if it's a if it's the dovi, I mean, it's got to go by itself. But I don't know. I don't remember the question either. You said you told me the question, right? All right. Let's I see. I got here. distracted because Clint said no. The manager was Mike Judge. I don't know. I just read it. Oh, that would make more sense. Yeah. Like the guy who's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Amanda Baker, welcome to Primetime Partner. Thank you so much. Yay, Glad hi, you're Amanda. here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll have a video out for you tomorrow. I mean, for just the, for you, the Amanda. Member, yeah. The members thing the comes Amanda out on video. Thursdays. Do a and little then, fish room vloggy type stuff. We wander let around. Let me know because yeah. I've never seen any. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you I, I asked you if you wanted partner. to be in one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Clint Walker said, no, I'm in Georgia. And yes, it's for Orlando. Oh, you're in Georgia. Why yep. do I think that you're in Texas? Well, it doesn't I really matter you because... I in Texas. Guess what? Georgia. Okay, um, sweet. See you in Florida. Uh, Myrtle said, hey, Jason and Joanna's attempt to get to grab our attention, try adding the at Primetime Aquatics before your comment or question. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. Yeah, that helps us because I can... It illuminates orange for us. It makes, yeah. makes it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Finn Wiggles, Halloween weekend? Yes. Yeah, they, they're crazy. Yeah, they it's just the way it works last out. Time too? Well, had it run in 2020, no, it was. I know. Oh. No. Because no? the 2019 Dallas was in the spring. And then. Okay. So then it wasn't Halloween. No. But last year, had it run, it was going to be on Halloween weekend as well. It wasn't. I don't think they tried to necessarily, like, oh, we got to have it on Halloween weekend. <laughs> it was just. That was when they had time available. Probably because it's Halloween. And, like,. Yeah, it seems like a good idea. I mean, most fish people would rather be hanging out with fish people than handing out candy anyway. So, right. Yeah, maybe that's all. Well, now in Dallas, that I think that should be a thing. Wow. I think in Dallas, Does that mean if you it's going to dress be, up. I didn't even think of that. You think there's going to be a lot of people that dress up like fish? I, think I would dress up like Dallas a fish. Dallas Aquashella. I would dress up like it, a better fish. We're going like to go, we're gonna have to go there with that, you know? And candy, like people go to the table. I mean, we had candy anyway, but. We're just gonna have to like do life size giant party size like I don't even know Kit Kats, no Reese's those Reese's oh, ones like, man. The, like my well, mind they is should like be kneeling. like that big they should be like the size of a cupcake like wouldn't that be cool that would be a way to get a lot of people to go to Aquashella in Dallas but like we're handing out cake sized one, I was gonna say cupcake one, sized one Reese's pound, cups yeah one pound Reese's yep. cups like, or like a Kit Kat cake. Oh, you, just, you just crack a big chunk off and oh my gosh. You leave, we all no. leave the weekend with really high blood sugar and rotten teeth <laughs> cool. what, it's a great time uh, let's see here oh this wait wait I didn't want to interrupt but can I interrupt well you just kind of did but... I know but I got so excited with this question wait hold on and every time you do that you break my train of thought um it's a movie so quote now, yeah um, right when you hear this or when you don't hear this, don't come down here. What's the movie from? What's the movie from? What's the movie from? What's the what's the line? What movie is that from? I'm That's what I blank. meant to say. Okay, here. From Jack LaPorte. Amanda's going to get it. Hey, Jack. Okay, I'm still struggling with filtration on my 15-gallon column tank. Oh, Me yeah. too. Would you recommend a Title 55 with flow turned down? I've tried sponge filters, but the area is so scarce. I know. I know. Yeah, the bottom. It's a struggle. This, it, it really is. Hey, I, 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 I wish I had a good answer for you with that tank. You're gonna have so the 55 is gonna be probably too much flow. Um, it, it's a lot of flow. It's a lot of money. And the other problem with that is it's going to if you've got the plastic lid 
I'm not even sure you'd be able to hang it on the back. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, somebody sent me an email the other day and they said they had a way to basically convert the Seachem Title 35 with a longer intake tube, yeah. like a DIY thing. I'm going to check Page. that out. Mary Page, I know, extended it down. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. And if it, if it if it's something that works, I might put a quick video out because I think that'll be useful for that 15-gallon column tank. But I, I really don't have an answer for it. That thing is, yeah, it's just My it's tank nuts. doesn't look crappy until like 20 hours after I do a water change. But like 20, it's like two hours. Like, like, where did all this come from? Change water. Yeah. You could use a turkey baster like every day too. Oh, yeah, great idea. Yeah. Um, a really long turkey baster. Yeah, a multi tank addiction. Thank you so much for the super chat. Getting my tickets for Dallas this weekend, so I'll see you there. Cool. Ooh. Yeah, that'll be good. It was fun last time we all hung out, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter O'Brien, thank you so much for the super chat. This is the only show I make time for to watch each Aww. week. Thank you. What state do you guys live in? A state of perpetual madness. I... I Come on, that was pretty good, right? That was a little bit good. No, uh, no. Illinois. We're in we're, we're in, in Illinois. Illinois. Yeah, we're in <laughs> Illinois, uh, just outside of Chicagoland. So, it's basically we get winter, we get two days of spring, then we get a lot of really hot weather, and then we get a day and a half of fall, and then we're back to snow again. Yeah, because we've just had we had we had like fifties, almost sixty. Yeah. Like on the weekend, I got the first batch of flowers outside. So excited! First day they went out, I bought them, put them in. Two days or one day later, it snowed and got really cold. And everybody at work was like, oh, I'm sorry. That's really too bad. I'm like, they're going to be fine. Don't worry. It'll be warm. And they're nice. fine. Cody, thank you so much for the super chat. I have a new koi pond in basement. 850 gallons for koi. I moved that That's from 220. Cool. I've used media from three filters, but now have 0.5 ammonia and 0.5 nitrite and 40 parts per million nitrate. So... Yeah, um, did you, my guess is if you didn't change the stocking levels, right? It was just, okay, I had the coin, the 220, they needed a bigger thing. I put them in the 850. Probably what's happening is, in, in a sense, what I just talked about at the beginning, and that is your fish tank is also a filter. And so what happens is, yeah, you, you did the right thing. You moved all of the filter media from those filters and put them in the, the 8, 850, but then that probably that obviously wasn't housing all of the beneficial bacteria in your old tank so were all the exposed surfaces and so now what you've got is this tank that is got just the the filter media and the filters itself and now it's got to establish that those microbes on the rest of those surfaces on the 850 to compensate for the bio load in there what you could do for right now is obviously a lot of the water additives, the dechlorinator, dechlorinators will also have ammonia neutralizers. And so like the like the Fritz ACCR has ammonia neutralizers, just to kind of bring that down a little bit. You could try adding, in this case, you'd probably have to do something like a Fritz Turbo Start, where it's really concentrated bacteria, and add that, and maybe that will help a little bit. And, and water change, and I know I'm saying water changes on an 850 gallon, like, all right, just do a water, just do a 50% water change, you'll be fine. Like, Ugh. I'm basically broke. I guess the nice thing with koi is you don't have to really worry about as much with the hot water, although depending on where you live, if you're just using like a hose or something, it's coming out of the ground and it's, it hasn't really, the ground hasn't really thawed yet, that water's gonna be very cold. So it stinks, but it's one of those things where you're gonna to have to wait until the microbes build up on the rest of those surfaces. The nice thing is because you use the used filter media, it's probably not going to take as long. And that's the reason why you still have the nitrates are registering because you do have microbes in there doing the ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. There's just not enough of them yet to get rid of the rest of the ammonia, but there will be a, probably be a, a, a faster cycle than starting from scratch for sure. Okay, Michael says the shining. Boom. That was it? Oh, that wasn't even like a it. main quote. It's not like I walked in and said, like, you know, did like one of the main ones, like when he's busting through the door or something like that. You mm -hmm. know, I watched that movie when I was a little kid. And I, I, to this day, They're I'm going to call out my parents on national TV here, um, national YouTube. But I don't know why they let me watch that. I don't think they really knew I was watching. It was one of those things where they were watching it and they thought yeah. I was asleep. And I wound up watching basically the entire movie as like a six-year-old. And then I think I pretty much slept in my parents' room for like two months after that because <laughs> it was really scary. So as a young child to do that. Yeah. Father Fish is here. 
Father, Father Fish. Fish. Welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. And Florida Fish Rescue. Florida Fish Rescue. Very awesome. The nice to are yeah. here. Nice to have it. Mm-hmm. Nice to have you here. Mm-hmm. Team Hype. I'm thinking about finally getting my first fish. An, an axolotl. My oh, tank is a 40 oh. breeder, and I'm scared mm-hmm. my floor is going to give way. Any suggestions <laughs> for starting? So you're getting an axolotl and a 40 breeder, so that works. Um I don't know a lot about axolotls. I haven't kept them. I just know what I know from other people keeping them. Uh, they generally like cooler water, so you won't need a heater. Not only will you not need a heater, you'll have to make sure that tank stays relatively cool. The 40 breeder, the nice thing with an axolotl is you don't really have to fill it all the way up, right? Because it's not like they're going to be super active swimming around anywhere, everywhere. So there's nothing that says you can't just fill it up halfway or two-thirds of the way. Uh, so that's something to think about. Uh, the floor giving way, as long as, I mean, I don't know the conditions of your floors or how the joists are running, but generally speaking, it's always more secure when you run the tank perpendicular to the floor joists. If you know, you know, if you've got maybe a basement, you can look underneath it and be like, oh yeah, the floor joists are running this way. I'll lay the tank that way and it'll, it'll be better. So it's always a, it's, it's, and sometimes I forget that it's always an interesting thing when you get a new tank, especially when you get a tank. And we've talked about this before. From like one of the Petco's or PetSmart's, and it comes with the just the standard wooden stand, and especially if it's a little bit larger, and you start filling that bad boy up, you're like, you're like mm-hmm. "How is mm-hmm. this thing going to hold up this tank?" Yeah. And it's it's amazing, but usually they do. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I knock on wood, it, they've always been okay, so that's good. Did you did you see Kylan said it's a dovi? Oh, good. Okay, so what was the original question? <laughs> oh, uh, is a dovi? Uh, a dovi wolfish a cichlid? Yes. Yes, it, it is. is. Yeah. Um, and it is a And there was a second part of that uh, question. Hold on here. So a little bit about dovi. They're huge. They are extremely aggressive. They generally are a fish that you're only going to want to keep by themselves. The only time I have seen people keep full-size dovi together is when the tanks are insanely big. Like I'm talking six, seven, 800 gallons. Maybe it, I, I think I saw somebody who had a 1200 gallon tank that had some dovi that were living together relatively peacefully. And I said, they, what I mean by that is they didn't kill each other, but they, you know, even still their fins were a little bit torn up. But the dovi is definitely, a, it's a wet pet sort of, I'm keeping this fish by itself because mm-hmm. anything else is probably going to make a bad situation. Um, what filter is better for, for one? Is there one that's better for, for one? For a dovi? Yeah. Um, depends on the size of the tank, but I think at that point, you're, I mean, you've are I you got to have a really big tank. I would say, if, ideally, oh my gosh, 220, 240 minimum, and then bigger maybe as they get larger. So at that point, you're probably just looking at a sump, right? And if it's not, if your tank's not drilled, then maybe a couple of canisters. But the thing is, you, you just don't want, as best you can, try to avoid the intakes and the returns being super exposed if you can. Like maybe you're putting them in the corners of the tanks on opposite ends to protect them as best you can so they don't get knocked off. Those fish are, they're cool, but they will mess some stuff up. Hmm. Uh, Danielle says, new shirts tonight? I missed the first 10 minutes. Stand up. Well, stand yes. Up. So I'm not going to stand up, but here you go. That's one of them. This is the watercolor. That's the watercolor. Primetime logo. Yes. And then I've got I've got the small scape one. Yeah. It's can you read it? I don't know. Can you see? It's called yeah. Scape Gaze Repeat. That's right. Scape. You look at it, and then make another one, and That's then make right. another one. Uh, hold on. Lovie's Planet says Aquarium Co-op has a great video where he visits a guy. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Maybe that's the video. I, I couldn't remember who produced that video where he visits a guy with huge tanks and he keeps dovi like 1,200 gallons. Yeah, and mm. if I remember correctly in that video, it's a very old video, but he had like a 1,200 gallon here, a 1,200 gallon. Then he went into another room and it was like, I don't even remember, like a three or 5,000 gallon tank. It was it was, it was was pretty cool. Wow. It was definitely cool. Uh, let's see here. Cody, thank you so much for the super chat. I've moved rocks and all the substrate uh, to and added more media on top of the old media. And yes, I've added prime and salt. My question is how much faster will will cycle? All right, so that's good. I, I, I Part of it just depends on how many koi you've got in there. It, it's a hard question to answer because 
in part of it's like, okay, well, how long was the 220 set up? Is it something they were in for like a year or, you know, six months where it was like, yeah, everything was covered. The fact that you move the rocks and everything in is good. It's, it's, it's just a matter of getting those microbes on the rest of the surfaces to grow in a large enough quantity. The, the salt will help a little bit. Uh, the prime, you, you keep doing that. How much faster will the cycle happen? It's hard to say. I mean, it, it, if it's a normal, you know, normally a cycle takes what? Dep again, part of this depends on the load, right? Like you could go in and be like, I ate a bunch of fish and then some died and I left them in there and it was a massive explosion of ammonia. But yeah, the tank cycled in like three weeks. Okay, great. But that the outcome wasn't very good. <laughs> Where normally to go through the ammonia the nitrite, and then start to see those things go away, it might take four weeks, all right? In your situation, maybe if, if I were a betting man, I would say probably half that time, I would say, because you've already got so much of the media in there and so much of the surface area. So there's a lot of microbes there. Now it's just a matter of them spreading out and, and being able to, to deal with it. So I would like to know though, if what how from start to finish how long it takes for that night for the ammonia nitrate to go down uh, so just leave a, a comment in one of the videos or maybe if you're in the the live chat next week or the week after i i would i would guess about half the time yeah uh regina thank you so much for the super chat 20 long overrun with new life platy fry mystery snail baby <laughs> shrimplets when do i start removing the babies so where are you going to put them? Um, yeah. If we're just putting them in new tanks or we're going to sell them? Because I, I would imagine eventually you're probably going to run out of space for all these th this stuff. Um, platy fry are pretty resilient. If you're just moving them to a new tank, I would wait until they're, you know, they're eating. Maybe they're about that big. So half an inch. You can move those to another tank without any issues. Probably smaller, but... Just to be safe, a half an inch. The, the mystery snails, you can move those whenever. As long as you can pick them up and chuck them in another tank. As long as they've got food to eat, I wouldn't worry about that. The shrimp, the shrimp, I'd probably wait until they are showing a little bit of color. Maybe about, uh, I don't know, three-eighths of an inch, half inch. They'll, they'll, most These things are everything that you're, you're breeding. The platy fry, the mystery snails, and the shrimp for the most part. As long as they're going into a cycle tank that's established, they they transfer pretty easily. I don't really worry too much about them. Sometimes when we're catching shrimp to sell at swaps and auctions, we get some smaller ones in there. I, they, they do okay. They live just fine. All right, let's see here. Uh, Whips World, that's no lie. My 210 weighs over a ton, and it's being held up by the balsa wood <laughs> they use for uh, <laughs> kid hand-thrown planes. Yep. It scares the heck out of <laughs> yeah. me. I know those. Yeah, that's not even bad. Some of those balsa. stands, and it, and it's not even like the wood goes all the way around in some of those like those kit tanks. Yeah, it's like you know you look at them like oh, wait wait a minute, there's a lot of wood on the sides, <laughs> right? Usually that's kind of like at least it appears as though it's one piece, but then it's like well I've got the doors that open. And you're like well wait a minute that means the only wood that's actually extending to the floor are like a couple of you know two or three pieces of wood going vertically, and then on the back side maybe you got a couple <laughs> more, and, you're like, and then. Some of these things, it's like they're not even using nails. They're using like those, the, like the heavier duty staples. And you're like, wow, this thing is being held together by staples. Yeah, scary. It's it's a little crazy. It is. Did I already tell you Wendy's here? Hi, Wendy. Wendy, she finally hello. made a, a live. That's a live awesome. Streamy, Glad you're here. Streamer. Uh, Triton says hello, my favorite nano lady. I don't know if I like to be called that. Do you have any suggestions on, <laughs> on where to get driftwood? The local fish store and big box stores near me are a bit sparse in selection. It's a bummer. It is. Well, I wonder what area you're in. Not if you're anywhere. Well, we have uh, a larger fish store, Aquarium Adventure, that will stock really, um, a, they have a really good a large um, selection. selection yeah. A high prices usually go along with it but the swaps if you can get to any whenever things open up that's usually your best bet you get a lot of selection you can root around and and get a really decent price you can try amazon but you're not going to really get to pick so i've you didn't you get a like a while back like a ways back oh didn't yeah you i got a giant p from amazon but you don't get to pick. oh it's you just know, like yeah. a surprise 
That's definitely something. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, channel sponsor Flip Aquatics. They have it. And the nice thing is they have pictures of it too, so you can kind of get an idea of, of what you're buying. That's I've gotten true. stuff from Amazon. It is a surprise. It's kind of like you want a piece of 20 inch driftwood, and you're like, okay, you got Malaysian, you got Mapai. I'm like, all right, let me just order this and see what happens. Sometimes we've gotten some really nice pieces, mm -hmm. and other times it's like. Thanks for the two by four, man. I yeah. don't know what I'm supposed to do with this thing, but here, take this two by four looking piece of driftwood. Yeah, I like that one piece that we have in our tank that I absolutely despise. Yeah, I like that at first, and now it's. I don't like it's it. It's not. It's it's grown off of me. Uh, Amanda <laughs> says I'm definitely on the scape gaze repeat cycle. Started <laughs> tank number seven this week. Yeah, woo! It, it can be one of those things where it's like exponential growth. I, I I'm sure some MTS. of you. I'm yeah. sure some of you can relate where it's like. I had one tank and then I, you know, it took me a few months. I got another one and then like a week later I got my next one. And then a couple days later I got three more and now I can't stop and I'm getting new tanks every six hours. So, although I like to also think about just not just MTS, I kind of like to think of it as MAPS, M-A-P-S, multiple aquatic plant syndrome. That's what I have. So then the more plants you get, the more tanks you need for your plants. So MTS MAPS. Throw it all okay. together and you just, good luck. Yeah, but you know what? What would life be like without having a bunch of tanks? I know. It's just something that happens. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Uh, Cody, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, should I reduce feeding and we'll leave updates? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about, so to kind of recap in the video, where if you've got ammonia or nitrite spikes, the whole idea is you've you got to reduce the amount of ammonia in the tank. And so... There's what way number one is to try to reduce it at the source. That's your fish. And so obviously you got to be careful with koi, right? Because their stomachs aren't as big as some fish and they like to eat more, eat more frequently, but you're going to feed them smaller meals just to get them by for the next week or so. Absolutely. So you're going to reduce the amount of feeding. The great thing is, like I said, you've got the filter media, you've got the surfaces uh, from your old, your old stuff, adding the salt's going to help reduce a little bit of the stress and the osmoregulation issues. Increase the water flow if you can, or just make sure you've got a lot of a lot of gas exchange because if there's any damage to the gills at all, that's going to help them still get the oxygen that they need. Uh, that will be helpful. Like I said, the the like the the Fritz Turbo Start is a more concentrated amount of nitrifying live nitrifying bacteria that will be helpful as well. And so we're just trying to attack it from a few different angles. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, Matthew says. And I believe you were talking to us, right? Matthew, you said that you're in our area. Yeah. Which fish stores do you recommend? Um, well, for fish, our two favorites are in Wisconsin, which are less than two hours away. So that's not bad. Uh, so that would be um, the two fish stores are the Fish Factory. And um, why do I always, I always think of Stein's. I get confused. The I know Steins I know. is across the street, and I Fish like that Factory too. And, um, What's the one that's across from Steins? Steins gets stuck in my head, and I can't think of the, it. Um, uh, um, wow! Now I can't think of it. Sorry, I jinxed you. But anyways, and then for me, for rocks, and like I said, the driftwood. I can't remember the other place. Um, the aquatic um, adventure, uh, usually in Schaumburg. There's also one in Bolingbrook. I like those because there's, I mean, they're rock selection, and they even have terrestrial plants. I mean, they're really, like, up in their game. And uh, February, they just had 25% all off of all their driftwood. I didn't think I was ever going to leave that store. And the other thing, too, if you're around this area, even though they're not running swaps and auctions in Illinois, they are running them at the Quad Cities, which I think is right on the border of Iowa. I don't know if you feel like driving that far. And then they also have the Milwaukee area, swaps that that are that are running and so usually those are the best places th those by far are the best places to find rocks and wood in terms of price so mm -hmm. uh, legend fish tanks i have a 75 gallon filter and a 50 to 120 gallon filter on a 55 gallon housing about 20 mbuna and one five inch common pleco is that too much filtration it's more than you need uh for biological filtration you know i obviously when we're when we're talking about 75 gallon filter to 50 to 120, we're talking about the so most likely that 75 gallon is running at least 300 gallons per hour, and the 50 to 120, I'm assuming is is way up there, right? I mean that's got to be running 500 gallons an hour, and you in a 55 gallon you you probably want to at least have 
450-ish going through there. So with, with that kind of a stocking level, um, it's not necessarily hurting anything unless it's really blowing the fish around constantly and they can't get a break. But yeah, it's fine. I mean, if you ever start up another tank, you've got another filter. You can just kind of plop right onto another situation. <laughs> plop it onto another situation. Plop. Aquatics Unlimited. Aquatics Unlimited. Thank In you Milwaukee. very much. Yep. That's the one. That's the other one. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry Reed, it's called getting older, Jason. LOL. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> It is definitely called that. Yeah. Um, uh, ooh, thank you so much, Michael, for the super chat. I am nearly ready to move my multi colony to the new 50. Low oh boy. Oh, oh, 50 pound. It says 50 pound. Oh, low, low boy. boy LB. All right. You get it? Yep. 50 gallon low boy. I plan on moving both sponge filters, the current rocks, and some substrate. Will this work? Probably. Again, just like we've been talking about with this, the koi situation. Um, could there be a, a potential for an ammonia spike? Maybe a very brief one, maybe, but I don't know. I I thought you said they were in a 20 long, maybe, or they were moving from a 20 gallon. So that's not as big of a difference as going from 220 to 875. But if you're moving all of this stuff, you, you could very well avoid the ammonia spikes and all that stuff. And like I said, for us, we generally don't have too much of an issue. I don't recall the last time we had an ammonia or nitrite spike, but yeah, I think you'll be, you're doing the right things. All right, let's see here. Rodney says, I just bought an Aquion seven and a half gallon cube LED shrimp tank. Mm. What do you think of the substrate it comes with? Some have complained of it raising pH. I seem to recall Joanna doing a maybe a review. I don't know what substrate that comes with. So isn't it the same that I have in my twenty? When my uh, what do you think of the substrate it comes with? I, I don't. The, the shrimp tanks don't they usually come up come with the? Uh, well, but that doesn't raise pH. So, um, if it comes with like the fluval stratum type stuff, often that will reduce pH. So, if you're worried about it, one of the things you can do again is just take some of that substrate, put it in a bucket with an air stone and test the pH over a course of a few days and see what it's doing to your water. That's that's a safe way to do things. Let's see here. Uh, York Aquariums, if you had to recommend a canister filter for a 30 gallon planted stocked with smaller schooling fish, what would you pick? I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty poor when it comes to like giving great advice with canister filters only because I don't use a lot of them, right? So the two probably the two most reliable brands are the Eheims and the Fluvals. And so if you can find either one of those that's going to be appropriate for your 30 gallon tank, that's, I would probably, they're gonna be a little bit, excuse me, a little bit more expensive, but that's probably the direction I would go, either the Eheims or the Fluvals. I had a Sun Sun, it worked fine for a while and then it started to leak. I don't remember the, the brand of the, the hang on back canister filter I had. That thing was like the worst filter I ever had in my life. <laughs> And so if I were running a canister, I'd probably just stick with one of those two just because the one thing we didn't talk about at the beginning is the canister filters, one of the potential downsides to a canister and a sump is you're pulling water out of the tank into a filter and then pumping it back in. And unlike the rest of the types of filters, there's that's the greatest chance for something to leak. And I don't want that to happen. So I'd rather have a filter that I have a little bit more confidence in, Eheim or the Fluval, then have that potentially happen. David, thank you so much for the super chat. How often do you change the filter media in a in canister filters or do you just clean the filter media? That's a great question. So when it comes to maintenance, there's a couple things. And I just wanna talk about maintenance in general. I promise I'm gonna answer your question about the canister. So sponge filters we clean every week. We clean them in tap water. I know it's controversial. Video's coming out on Friday to explain why that is okay. So check that out on Friday. Weekly, so we do that weekly. We change out all of our filter media and our hang on backs every single week because it's simple and because they, they tend to catch a lot of stuff because the tanks are heavily stocked being cichlid tanks. The matten filters, for instance, are kind of like sponge filters, but the such are pain to, to, to clean. Maybe I would do those every couple months. The canister filters depends on your stocking levels. If it's a moderately stocked tank, so it's an average stock tank or maybe I don't know, you got cichlids in there or something. If it's average stock tank, I might not open that thing up for a month. 
If I've got a bunch of cichlids in there, I might have to maintenance that thing every couple of weeks. The way you're going to know as you run that canister filter more and more, you're going to see the water flow getting reduced, right? And once you, I mean, you could take that that return tube and kind of, even if you pull out of the tank a little bit, and just kind of watch the water going in. If it's starting, you know, you'll know what it's like when you first set up, like, oh, wow, yeah, this thing is really awesome. And then two weeks later, you pull out, I'm like, oh, that's not looking like the way it used to. That's what I use to gauge with a canister filter, when does it need to be maintained? Because that tells you the filter floss in there is probably getting clogged up or your sponges are getting clogged up. It's reducing the water flow and it's probably time to change the media out, which means if I'm running filter floss, I just change that. I, I very rarely will ever rinse filter floss, although you can. The sponges, quickly tap water, make sure all the black gook comes out, right back in they go. The bile rings, unless they're covered in stuff, I leave those alone. And that's kind of how I would roll with it. Sue, thank you so much for the super chat. You guys are one of my favorite fish tubers. I have a 45 gallon that is heavily stocked with fish, plants, and snails. I use three filters in it, sponge, hmm. canister, and internal. Opinions. It's, if it, I, it, so let's see here. Three filters, sponge, canister, and internal. Again, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with having more than one filter, right? In fact, you could make an argument that having more than one filter is good. If one breaks down, you still have plenty of filtration and media that's been cycled that is going to, to help that. Um, would Do you need all three? No, probably not. And for biological, especially if it's heavily planted, I think that sponge filter would probably be everything you'd need for biological. But the nice thing about the canister filter and the internal filter is now you're getting all that mechanical filtration. And so if things are floating around in the water, it's both of those, the canister and the internal are both catching all that stuff. Do you need both of those? Most likely not. Now, again, if the canister filter is only rated for a 20 gallon tank, then maybe it's it's best to have them both because then you're getting the, the mechanical filtration for both. So it's, it's fine. You're... Again, you've got a filter. If you ever set up another tank, you could probably put one of them in another tank and, and have an instant recycled <laughs> filter. Yeah, so, that's another good yeah, thing. But thank you again. Thank you so much for the super chat. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, Samuel Wolf, any tips for sexing speciosis? Um, let me see. Here. While you look that up, um, I'll answer a quick question here. Inga, um, Filter suggestions for a tiny nano tank, like 2.5 gallons. I did have a number of them before, and all of them we put in, in a, it's by Aquatop. It's a very tiny little filter, and um, I think it's like something like $5 on Amazon. And it's got like a little, uh, it almost looks like a, when I showed them, people were, were always asking, what is that? Because it looks like a little like cup. It, like a filter, a little sponge filter is sitting in a cup, but it's actually like a two part and it's got the media in the little cup, but it's, it's an aqua top, a little tiny one. All the aqua top sponge filters? Mm -hmm. Is it two and a half gallon? Yeah. And then the other option would be, even though it's it's technically rated for a larger filter, if you didn't want to deal with the sponge filter, larger the, the uh, Forza 5 to 15 hang on back filter. It's made by aqua top as well. Okay. And that's cool because it's adjustable. And so then you can bring the water, um, the water flow down quite a bit for this uh, if you tank that size. It, yeah. So the speciosis, Sam, the, what I'm getting is, and I, I didn't recognize that name, but it's showing me salt water. And I know zero mm. about salt water, like less than zero. I am an anti-expert, so I'm sorry I can't answer your question. Nothing. Yeah, I got nothing for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I've never kept salt water in my life. I think they look awesome. I just don't have the time for them. <laughs> um, let's see here. What else we got going on here? I saw I saw my name somewhere. You did. I think I did. Okay. Well, you keep looking. Oh, Amanda. Yeah. Wait. I have to check out um, Echinodorus Vesuvius. If you haven't already, curly, cute, good size for nanos and spreads by runners. Sign me up. Cool. Yep. I'll do a screen print of that. Yeah, I'll be checking that out in just a few okay. minutes. I got a good one here. Yup. I've recently purchased Fritzheim 7 online, but there is a bad smell coming from it. Is that normal? Yes. <laughs> so it's bacteria. It's live nitrifying bacteria. And 
they even say on their website, sometimes the stuff stinks. It doesn't mean that it's gone bad. Uh, but yeah, it, it can have a very earthy sort of smell to it sometimes. Uh, we've used it when it's like that and it seemed to do the job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, Rod. Oh, I was just going to read that one. Uh, I did it first. Stop pygmies, Corey's. Thank you so much for the super chat. Quarantining five pygmy coys. Feel bad not feeding. Um, oh, so they're not eating. The, oh, because they're... Wait. Oh, I read uh, the question before that. Would you feed it all during quarantine of five small pygmy coreys? They're so small. Feel bad not feeding. Yeah, I feed definitely feed during quarantine. Um, I don't feed a lot, especially at first. I want to make sure that they're eating the food that goes in there. But... Uh, for the pygmy quarries, you know, crush up a little bit of flake. Because sometimes the pygmy quarries like to actually swim in water sometimes. They'll take food from the water column. If they're not and you want to try a little bit of like micro pellets, you could do that too. And just But just watch it. Make sure that they're actually eating because you don't want the water to foul up and then cause other issues for your fish in the quarantine process. But yeah. Um, Lampralogus. Oh, oh, ocelotus. Sorry, Sam. Okay. Uh, black ocelotus. All right. Now, uh, for... for Males and females, <laughs> it's it's kind of like the golds where the the males are going to be larger. They're going to be significantly larger. The females tend, if you really look at them side by side, what you're going to wind up seeing is that the males have more color in a little bit of a, a tint to their fins, especially their dorsal fin, and the females stay smaller. The problem with that is usually you're not going to be really be able to notice that until you see a couple of them together next to a shell. And when they're hanging out together, they're like, oh yeah, now I get it. Um, so as long as you've got a group, if you've got a group that is four to six of them, and I know depending on the size of the tank, that can be a little bit rough. If you start to see pairing up, then you're gonna know right away. Like, oh yeah, he said that we're gonna be smaller and that their colors are a little bit different. But other than that, it's, yeah, it's that, uh, it, it can be a little bit hard to tell. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Thoughts on Fritz? Fix-ick? Oh, oh Fix-ick. Fix uh, would you recommend and what filter maintenance needs to be done after treating for ick? So I haven't used that product. So I don't know how it works. There's there's basically two things that I use to treat ick. One is ick X, And the other, if I've got a really bad bout of ick that I don't think I, the ick x will treat in time is then I go with the copper safe as long as I don't have plants and vertebrates or copper sensitive fish in the tank um, and so I, I will use one of those two uh, the fix ick I from what I've heard people have said it works but I, I don't know I, I don't I haven't used it so I'm not going to be a good source be like oh yeah you put in this and you know, uh, do the water change after 48 hours. I would say if you use it, it's most likely going to be fine. And just follow the directions in terms of the water changes um, and what filter maintenance needs to be done after treating for ick. I don't do anything with the filter media after treating for ick because if you've treated it su successfully, like I, like I talk about in the video, and that is you've treated and then the spots go away and you're still using the meds for about a week or so after. You're still doing the elevated temperatures. You're still adding the salt if the fish and the setup are okay with the salt for about 10, 12 days after you see the last spots. It's gone. I don't. It's gone. You don't have to worry about it in your filter media for the most part. I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it in the gravel or anything like that. So th because the other issue is. Some of these ick meds, like especially copper safe, it can it can definitely do some damage to your beneficial bacteria. All right, some of these things are antimicrobial. So the last thing you want to do is, I successfully treated ick, I removed all my filter media, I also reduced the microbes all over my tank by treating for ick, and now I remove the media and I've got an ammonia spike, which creates stress, which if there was even any ick parasites left, is going to reintroduce that problem. So. Usually I leave the filter media in it, at least for a couple weeks after I've treated it. Jerry's question is Jer good. Jerry, thank you for the super chat. Has anyone thank ever you. experienced a thick, clear, gelatinous coating on driftwood and rocks during a fishless cycle and bottled biology, six foot, 125 gallon, and a flu ball FX4? 
you're going to raise your hand? Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's a fungus. It's yeah. your friend fungus. If you're going to use driftwood, it's that's going to be your friend for a while mm -hmm. until the fish come and take care of it. It's a fishless cycle. Leave it in there. Mm. Really, I know it doesn't look great. It will go away. Yeah. Um, and then once you have no ammonia, no nitrite, and you're registering nitrates, you start adding fish. Uh, some fish will eat it. Sometimes bristlenose pleckles will eat it. Sometimes snails will eat it. Mm -hmm. It's not harmful necessarily. It doesn't look the best, but yeah. it's there for a week yeah. at most. So either it's either some type of biofilm or fungus. Totally normal. It's even normal. Like even when we boil some mm -hmm. of the driftwood, we'll still boil it, put it in there, yeah. and still get that. So what I like to do if it really bothers you and if it's not too much, I like to take a toothbrush and just kind of scrape it off and then kind of pull it out with the toothbrush. That yeah. might help you out, but. But since you're do since you're cycling the tank, I would probably leave it in there because <laughs> most likely there there could be a chance that it is somewhat beneficial to your cycle. Fin wiggles. I was thinking the same thing. Jerry, you oh. were great in Smokey and the Bandit. Jerry Reed. She asked it. Oh, if, I I don't know who that if is. You're the real Jerry Reed. Was Jerry who was Jerry Reed the cop? No, the uh, uh, didn't he uh, he was a musician, right? Guitar? I don't know. I think he played a guitar. David LL, thank you so much for the super chat. Do you think that 125 gallon can accommodate an Oscar with South American cichlids such as blue, black, acara, blood parrot, severum, angelfish, firemouth, three silver dollars, and an oddball bicher? So, I might leave the bicher out. Not because I think there's going to be an issue with aggression. I don't necessarily think that. I think what's going to wind up happening is those fish eat pretty slowly compared to the other fish, especially the Oscar, that blood parrot's going to go all crazy for food. The fire mouths tend to be pretty aggressive eaters. Silver dollars, when they're hungry, are extremely fast eaters. So for that reason, I might not do the bicher. The Akara and the Oscar will most likely get along just fine. Neither one of them are particularly aggressive. The blood parrot might be a little bit, little bit assertive but most likely will learn how to deal with that situation. The Severum would work fine. The Angelfish, uh, aggression-wise, probably not going to be an issue. Activity-wise, the Blood Parrot might stress them out. Young Oscars might stress them out just because of the activity level. The Silver Dollars, I might... Well, probably, I mean, they're, they're fine. They're, they're, they're going to fit in fine with that mix. The, the only thing I'm thinking about, the only reason why I'm hesitating is what I want more than three. Uh, just because they are, they tend to like to hang out. And so I might up that a little bit. So maybe not, if it were my tank, right? And obviously it's your tank. You can kind of do what you need to do. But if it were me, I might remove the Bicher, possibly the Angelfish, add in a few more silver dollars and go that direction. But I think temperament-wise, the fish are not going to like necessarily pick on each other. But you never know with cichlids, right? They Sometimes they do. But yeah, that's kind of how I would roll with it if it were my tank. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Well, let's do, oh my goodness, let's do a couple more questions. How about that? Really enjoying our, our thing tonight. Uh, let's see here. Just going through, looking for the highlighted orangey questions. <laughs> Clint, the thing about Fritz Ick is, Fix Ick is that it is more natural based. Sometimes it's just not enough to the trick. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. So if it's the more natural kind of thing, again, I don't know about Fritz Ick, but when I've tried natural remedies for Ick, I've never gotten them to work. So, and I don't know about this product. Maybe it works just fine. Uh, let's see here. Oh, good question, Peter. Yes, what's your opinion on UV light filtering? Do they work to clear algae? Uh, that's a great question. So the UV light, we've run actually run a couple filters. We have we the Sun Sun that we had ran a it had a UV light. We actually have an aqua top hang on back filter that also has an internal UV light. Will it clear algae? Probably not. So what the UV light is going to do is, you know, and you can have a separate UV light in a tank. Sometimes people use that if they've got an outbreak like like ick. It's only going to have an impact on life that is going through the filter directly being exposed to the UV light. And so because algae isn't really a waterborne thing, now it will do a great job if you've got like a green, uh, a green water outbreak. That is certainly something that will kill like the green water. But if it's just algae connected to surfaces, 
it's going to have probably no impact whatsoever. But like I said, the UV light comes in handy. Oh, I've got an ick outbreak. I'm doing the ick meds. I'm doing the heat. Let me put my UV sterilizer in there. And so as the water is getting sucked through that UV uh, filter, it's destroying a lot of those parasites that are actually in the water column. So that's where I think you get the maximum benefit from that. Uh, David LL, thank you so much again for the super chat. They are all getting along in a 60 gallon. Oh, so you already have them. They're about four inches and planning to upgrade to uh, have an Oscar. But thank you. I appreciate your opinion. Uh, interesting. Yeah. So again, part of it depends on the size, right? But if they're all getting along, that's a great, that's, that's very encouraging. Uh, the Oscar, you know, you're going to a 125. So adding the Oscar, you're probably going to add a relatively small one, I would think, because they're cute and you get like a little two or three incher. And as long as the other fish aren't huge, right? Yeah, I put a two or three inch Oscar in there and you've got like, oh, my fire mouth is like six or seven inches and like crazy. Um, that didn't work. Well, that escalated really quick. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's good. I'm glad they're getting along because that, that, that helps. Ginger's Let's, here. I saw Ginger's name. Hi, Ginger. Ginger, hello. Glad you're here for and, the, the end. Um, Finn Wiggles, um, you asked if I have a heater, what heater I have in the 12 um, gallon. We don't have heaters because they're in the fish room. Toasty yeah. world. Yeah, that fish room. It, it's funny because when we're shooting videos down there all the time, it, one of the things we, we have to do is kind of be aware of the time because if you're down there for a long period of time shooting videos and you've got yeah. like the lights and all that stuff running, it gets warm because we keep that we keep the basement right around so the ambient temperature is right around 82 80 to 82 which keeps our fish tanks depending on where they're located in the fish room anywhere from 76 maybe as high as 80 at some parts of the in some parts of the fish room depending on the, the time of the year so it's a little warm down there uh john smith do you increase feeding when fry are present it's a maltese tank and only just started seeing my first fry feeding baby brine shrimp. Do I increase? Um, not really. So cause then that's always the kind of like the lure, right? It's like, oh, I got babies. I got, gotta make sure they're getting food. And the next thing you know, you've got too much food in there and then things start to not look the best. The fact is if you're feeding a live baby brine a couple times a day, if you're target feeding that, like, oh, let me just kind of dump some in there or squirt some in there right next to where they're at, they're getting enough, right? Cause they're so tiny. Yes, the, the adults are eating it as well, which is fine. But I've never worried about the fry not getting food in our multi tanks. The trick, if you want to try this, is I first feed out the flake foods or the micro pellets, or if I've got blood worms or something I want to put in there, I feed that first. And so that way, all the grown ups, all mm -hmm. the adults, all the adults in the room, That's they the eat, they get a nice full belly. Now, when I squirt in the live baby brine, are they still going to eat that? Yeah. Are they going to go after it as much? Not really, because they've got a full belly with all the food I've already fed them. So I usually do that. That's kind of how I do it. So feed the adults their, their grown-up food at the grown-up table. And then the live baby Brian goes to the little kid table. <laughs> little kid shells. Aww, yeah, that's so right. Cute. All righty. Let's see. Let's do one more question mm -hmm. here. And then we'll, we'll call it a night. Let's see. What do we got? What do we have? Uh, Tony says, hi, guys. Finally, I caught your live stream for the first time and loving it. Really great. Woo. Jason, your nitrogen cycle videos are superb. Learned so much from them. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm glad that you found them helpful. And again, we're going to have a science-like video coming up on Friday. And part of it's going to be a little bit of more uh, in-depth explanation of the nitrification process and the microbes that are actually involved in that process. So I hope you find it somewhat uh, enjoyable for those of you who like to nerd out on the sciences. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Hi guys, love the channel. Join the stream late. You may have answered this. How long can I run an established filter on an empty tank before I start losing beneficial bacteria? That's a great question. I haven't answered that. You're going to most likely lose back. You're going to lose bacteria fairly quickly, right? I don't know the answer to that. Like, I don't know if it's are you're going to lose it in six hours or 12 hours or five days you'll start because there's no ammonia there's nothing in there producing the food that they need the ammonia and then the ammonia goes to nitrite you're going to probably lose you're going to start losing it in a matter of a day the question really becomes how heavily was the tank stock before because here's the other interesting thing the aquarium is a closed system, which means there's not anything 
entering the system from the outside, like rain or, I don't know, bird poop or something like that. And nothing's really leaving that system. So in microbiology, we, we have this, this growth curve that we talk about where you have a lag phase where the microbes are kind of getting used to their surroundings, where they're not really growing. You've got an exponential phase where they've got all this space and potentially a bunch of food if there's a lot of food there. And then they kind of level off in a stationary phase where they're competing. What you're basically doing is taking it from that stationary phase where they were all competing for food in an established tank. And now we're going into the next phase and that is kind of our, our death phase and our prolonged death phase where they're competing for a limited amount of nutrients. And so what's gonna wind up happening is the microbes that are dying the heterotroph, heterotrophic microbes that are eating those dead microbes, which there will be some, are then producing ammonia too. So you're going to get dieback almost immediately, but depending on how heavily that fish, that filter media was seeded with bacteria, it might not matter when you reuse it. If you're reusing it like, oh, in a few days or a week, the one thing you can do to try to keep the microbes established, if you've got an empty tank with no fish, and one of the things that we do is, uh, in a lot of our, our tanks that we're not really using for grow out or anything, I'll throw a bristlenose pleco in there because they breathe like crazy. Oops, and we have a whole bunch of them. Uh, if you don't have those, maybe you've got some, and I don't necessarily know if you want to introduce snails into your, your fish room, but if you've got them, you know, like we've got tanks where there's nothing in there but Malaysian trumpet snails, but I feed them. And so they're eating and they're getting the micro, you know, they're, they're producing the ammonia that microbes need. So that's something you could think about. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Danny Can Aquatics, thank you so much for the super chat. Love your cichlid-based channel. Well, I appreciate it. Finn Wiggles, thank you so much for the sticker. Drop in the mic. Aww. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Glad you are here. And, and you're not old unless you remember when you had Atrex. H. So are you old enough to uh, name off your Atrex that you used to have in your collection? I've got, I remember Atrex. I had Grease, Blondie, Superman. The like the soundtrack to Superman. Those yeah, are the three I can remember. I remember Barry Manilow. My my yeah. parents had Elvis Presley. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, um, um, Phil, uh, what's his name? Phil, Phil Collins. Phil Collins. Yeah. And then for some reason we had Kiss eight Genesis. tracks everywhere, and so the, as kids we were like rocking out to <laughs> to Gene Simmons or whatever that was. That's probably like <laughs> not, not a, really appropriate for like a little tiny kid. But let's face it, they let me watch The Shining, so. It's like after that, it's like, oh, he's just listening to Kiss. He watched The Shining. What difference does it yes. make now? We already oh, messed him up. The so, cars. Um, the cars. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Hold on. I saw one thing that popped up. Uh, oh. Bill A. Isn't Earth just a big closed system? Kind of, but not really. Because you've got massive amounts of ecological differences from one area to another that can change, mm -hmm. thus creating competition. Uh, Clint Walker, unfortunately, I am well aware of eight tracks in the car on family <laughs> <Right>. trips. <laughs> You're a fancy yeah. car. Yeah, those are good things. Wait, Ginger said I'm a fan of low. <laughs> a fan of low. He has, he has, FYI, if you are a true fan of low, then he does actually. What's a, wait a minute, hold on. What's a fan of low? I thought they were just. Um, Barry Manilow. Fan of low, I'm assuming. Barry oh, Manilow, boy. fan of low. He okay. has one of the best versions of Jingle Bells out. I'm just saying that. Yep. Uh, yeah. I'll Bill A says he remembers the video discs. I remember my, oh, my friend had the beta yeah. player. Oh, that's and that right. was back in you know the beta player days. And then those things kind of went the away. Blockbuster? Yeah. Not to be confused with the beta. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember. All right. Well, this is, this is uh, really falling off the rails yeah. pretty quick here. All right, Captain everybody. Captain Neil. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to call it a night before we just go way off and start talking about yeah. non-related fish things. And people are watching on the playback. They're like, really? Younger I just wasted like, what are they 10 minutes of my about? life for this. <laughs> <laughs> Linda Ronstadt. So, all right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Appreciate everybody with all the super chats and the questions. If I didn't get to your questions, because there was quite a few of them today, I'm sorry. Um, Hope to see you here again next week, and we will we'll see you next week. We've got a couple videos coming out Friday on my channel on Prime Prime, Prime 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 Time Aquatics, and then your channel on Saturday morning, the Small Scape. Yep. So yeah, you guys have a great night. Hope you have a great week and happy end of St. Patrick's Day. Yes. Bye everybody. Bye. Do, 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 thing press.